All right. Well, hello everyone. Today we are um, back together again, Jen, Jenny, and myself. And this is part four of our series that we've been doing on I don't even know what's the there's a tangential series that has has been flowing through different topics. We started with talking about marriage and we talked about uh, non-monogamy, polyamory, and, you know, the ethics of different types of relationship styles. And then we talked about beauty last time we got together. And today we have kind of a a, a collection of things that we have ideas about. So one of the things that came up in our conversation last time was, um, or or maybe it was after our conversation, I'm not sure when we sort of came up with it, but this idea of the uh, jealousy as relates to uh, trans women wanting to emulate women and this theme of wanting to be the thing that you seek, that you admire, that you think is beautiful. And we talked a little bit about one of the, the topics was around the lactation fetish, um, but I don't know if we want to get into that. Jenny, you had some really great thoughts on this that you explored in one of your recent Substack pieces. And so that would be interesting to go into a little bit more. There's a bunch off of that that we could branch off of. And then there's the the singer. How do you say her name? Uh-oh, your, your sound is off again. Let's see. So while you figure that out, there's an Irish singer, and I am terrible with Irish names because they are, they're, they don't, they don't seem phonetic to me. So, they're, but they're beautiful <laughs> when you, when you understand them. But there's a singer who's been very um, harshly retaliated against by her record label, and that's been getting a lot of news. So that's something that perhaps we could address. I think your sound is back on, Jenny. Oh, good. Okay. And then yeah, the final you topic. Are, right the final topic that we might, if we have time to get into, it might be interesting is another, another internet uh, sort of contemporary scandal that's been going on between two, I guess that are the MMA fighters or something like that, who were kind of smack talking each other when one of them decided to bring the other man's fiance into it and put them, put this man down by criticizing his fiance's, uh, dating history and her so-called body count as, as they're calling it now with uh, lots and lots of previous partners. And so this is, this brings up a lot about sexual ethics and attractiveness and mate value. And so just, these are kind of an interesting collection of topics and what, what sparks something with you guys today? I mean, I think they all are related to resentment because I think longing and unfulfilled longing leads to resentment. Um, I mean, with the body count issue, it's slightly separate because there's bigger factors at play that you mentioned earlier, Leslie, like um, the commodification of sex and the kind of this, the, the promotion of like whoredom. <laughs> um, but I think incels in general um, are very resentful of, you know, successful males and the females that flock to them. But when it comes to the trans identifying men, and I've seen so many, so, so many comments and screen grabs and tweets um, in my trolling through social media, or I should say trolling through social media, um, that really lay bare this sense of um, bitterness that comes from this really strong, and I would say even poignant, if you want to put a positive spin on it, very poignant longing to be something that you are not. And one of the factors in that, I personally think, is the fact that a beautiful young, especially young, but a beautiful woman, in, in, of, of, even of, of any age, even in middle age, shock horror, um, a beautiful woman is such a powerful, almost magical force, and it can cast a spell on the people who are looking at her. Mm. And I know this because I have eyeballs and I have seen that in other women. I have felt this, and without any sexual desire whatsoever, but whether they're supermodels in the 90s or people I've met or people I've known, just beauty that really kind of like sucks you in and you are in a spell from it. 
And I think we're so bombarded by images uh, from absolutely no age. Uh, and I think it's, it's gotten to the, this like hyper real level. And I think younger people, people a generation or two younger than us, are, have it even worse in terms of this like constant bombardment of their synapses and their nervous system um, of beautiful, you know, or sexually appealing or whatever you want to call it, women. And I think it really messes with people's spirits. Um, so I wrote this piece a couple of weeks ago because I felt like I recognized that in trans identifying men, even though then they, they go ahead and they, they, it really curdles and it turns to hatred and it turns to misogyny. Or maybe it's always, maybe it was, miso maybe they were misogynists to start with, but this idea of like, you're so beautiful. I want to be with you. I want to live in your skin. I mean, that's how it presents itself often in these comments. So I'm not saying, oh, poor them, you know, they're victims. I'm just, I'm just saying I recognize that like, I read, cause there's one comment in particular where this man was sitting at a table having been rejected according to his, his telling of it in a Reddit comment, he had been rejected by a lesbian because he's a dude. And um, there's a table of girls chatting and drinking and talking about boys. And he literally specifically mentions their sundresses and their, their hair. And I'm like, Oh, you just, you just really long to be that you're, you're mesmerized, you're spellbound by this beauty. And you, you don't know how to be an adult male and, and really process that in a healthy way. It's gross. It's very gross. Hmm. But there was this weird sense of recognition because, you know, I think all of us go through phases where we feel ugly. We feel like losers, especially when you're a teenager, especially when you're young and you look at someone who you think is prettier than you. Mm -hmm. And you would really give almost anything to look like them and carry yourself like them. And you don't really know what's going on in that person's life. You don't see yourself as you really are and you don't see them as they really are. You know, perceptions are so skewed. Um, but I recognize that feeling. I recognize it. So it was very weird. It was very weird when I started seeing that in, in these trans identifying men who in every other way I find pretty abhorrent, especially in their, the versions of these people that are posting these grotesque comments mm. about how much they hate women because they're so pretty and they don't even realize. And we trans women have to work so hard. I'm like, mm. yeah, yeah, screw you, dude. <laughs> like <laughs> this, none of this makes any sense and you need to get over yourself. Um, but I, I felt this strong recognition of like, oh, I remember feeling like that when I was young and immature and insecure. And I even told this dumb story about, I wasn't even that young. I was in my thirties and I, I had put on a lot of weight and I was, I really wanted to wear these well, like Hunter wellies. Cause I, they, to me, they were like a signifier of like class and poise. And I wanted to be that like willowy, beautiful, fine boned, like, girl and I wasn't at all and I was very stout and I bought these really expensive wellies and I insisted on wearing them I only did one time because I you know ultimately I could tell at the end of the day that was a mistake and I looked ridiculous but I did it anyway I paid tons of money for these damn boots and I wore them even though they looked like crap I couldn't fit them over my calves you know what I mean it was embarrassing and I paraded <laughs> around uh, Prospect Park in Brooklyn with my poor husband, like trying to pretend like, yeah, honey, you look great, you know, and I did it anyway. So that's a very trite comparison in a, in a sense, but like I, I spent too much money and I looked ridiculous all in service of my longing to be, uh, to appear as some physical entity that I was not. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I actually, I think that the piece hit a chord with a lot of people. Um, but going back to the, that feeds jealousy and resentment. And jealousy and resentment are incredibly, they're, they're, like, they're literally murderous. They're, mm -hmm. they're the worst of all the emotions um, and certainly the most toxic. And I was reminded of this this week when this Roisin Murphy, uh, Roisin is how you pronounce her name, um, was canceled um, for, it, she was outed. She made a private comment on her private Facebook page and someone screen grabbed it and put it up on social media. She's very well known in the UK. I don't know if she's that well known in America or not. Um, she's fairly well known. She's like a, a very successful indie artist, I guess. And, um, you know, she's been dragged all over social media. And there was reports, which I don't think have been confirmed by the record label, but somebody claiming to know the record label's intention claimed that the, the record label was not only about to release her album, but not promote it in any way. But any sales that did arise from the album, this was the report. We're going. They were the record label was going to donate. Uh, be they were going to donate the proceeds to a trans, like an organization that su supports trans kids. And her comment had been 
please don't call me a turf. It's a really terrible term, but you know, um, puberty blockers for children are so grim. You know, these are just mixed up little kids that shouldn't, they should, they shouldn't be given puberty blockers. That was her comment. So, so th- there was a, a report that was repeated all over various publications saying that the company was going to not only punish her, but take her money and give it to trans organizations, which I just thought was like particularly psychopathic and sadistic. And it sent me into like a rage spiral. And so I like dashed off this piece today about it. And, you know, it's like the entire social justice movement, but particularly the trans thing is driven by this dark, vicious jealousy. Mm -hmm. And it's so messed up. I don't think, I don't think women who claim a trans identity, I wouldn't put them in that category. I don't think they're jealous of men necessarily. I think they're trying to run away from their female bodies and I'm generalizing. Obviously I'm generalizing. But the men who claim a trans identity, I really strongly feel are driven by jealousy. Well, I had a really hard time with self-acceptance when I was a kid. And I can rem- I went through a very painful bout of gender dysphoria for oh. a number of years. Um, I was when I was about eight years old, I can remember I I wanted I, my I had been begging my mother for a long time, cut my hair off like my brother's hair. And so finally she relented and I got this really short boy's haircut. And it was a few years there where even after that, and my hair was growing back out, I, I was obsessed with the idea of looking like a boy. And I wanted, I, I loved that my shadow looked like a boy to me and I could pretend to be a boy. And when I would look in the mirror again and I would see a girl and I would see my legs were getting long and my hips were getting round. And I, I really hated this. And it was really, it was, it was super painful for me to ha- come to terms with being a girl and having feminine attributes because I wanted to be a boy. I had that longing that you're talking about. I really, yeah. really longed to be a boy. And then it sort of took a different shape. And I can remember longing to be a better looking girl and feeling that that jealousy and that that uh, that obsession with looking prettier than I was. Um, wanting to be, I can remember this actress. I saw her photo in a magazine. uh, And I just felt she was young. She Mm -hmm. was about my age. And I just wished with all my heart that I could wake up the next day and be her instead of myself because she was so beautiful. And I was so awkward. Yeah. So that longing that you're describing, I, uh, when you called it poignant, and that, that really resonates for me, I can remember feeling like that about about specific things, and then about more general things as well. And coming back to the commodification of of sexuality, I think Jenny might, maybe you froze a little bit there for a second. Um, hopefully that'll come back on. But I I wonder about, about that, like as we have gotten, as we are selling beauty, beauty is a commodity. It's, an, it's used for advertising and it's advertised. And the, the way that we influence people, I think about social media influencer is through being really beautiful and, and selling the, the cachet that goes along with that. And at the same time, our culture is becoming more uh, like sexuality is divorced from connection. Porn can fill your need for release and girls can sell their own porn. You can do homemade, you can do only fans and it's okay. You're liberated. You're being you're in touch with your sexuality. You can engage in all these ways that really it's like you're buying and selling attractiveness, attraction, sexuality. The endpoints of this are all divorced from actual connection for people. So at some point it makes, it does kind of make sense that we'd have some wires crossed and a young man might instead of falling in love with a woman's beauty and wanting to say romantically acquire that woman he would separate her beauty from her substance and want to acquire that beauty for himself and it just seems like another twist on you know i guess the breakdown of connection attraction sexuality jen what are your thoughts Uh, well, I don't know. I, um, I'm really, I'm really aware of the harm that 
pornography does to people who become heavy viewers. And I know there's a lot of people who are able to watch porn without becoming heavy viewers, but there's there's been such a rise in pornography addiction since it went digital. And I've seen the effect that it has on people's lives. They get into progressively more deviant behavior, sometimes to the point where they end up getting arrested um, for things like soliciting prostitutes or exposing themselves publicly. And I've seen the effect that it has on relationships. So I'm really, um, you know, aware of the harms of that. And I, I don't think that, um, you know, people who have their own, their own kind of only fans page and they're making money from it. And some of them enjoy a, you know, a fair amount of financial success with it. I still feel, I understand wanting the financial independence. And that's something I do think is extremely valuable. But in this case, I think it's coming at a cost, not just to that person, but to society and to relationships in general. So it's, it's not a trend that I feel um, happy about at all. And I still think that it's ultimately, you know, you can say, oh, well, I'm owning my sexuality and this is empowering, but it's still really um, basing your value around this, the sort of immediate sexual needs of men and fulfilling those needs and making that the central thing that's most important about you. And I think it's, um, if we have souls, I think it's sort of um, damaging to the soul. Uh oh, Jenny, I think you're, there's a problem with your audio. So we'll see if that, we can get that back. Um, <clears throat> Jennifer, I think that's a really interesting and good point that you're making there. Like when we think about what makes sex so compelling? What is it that makes it the most compelling thing? It's the thing that can create obsessions to the degree that it does with pornography and with with one another. I mean, we've as people are just obsessed with sex and sexuality. And why would that be? And why would it be so pleasurable and so sought after? It's and, and perhaps that's just because it is the act of making life. And so it is the thing that life incentivizes most strongly out of all, all things that can be incentivized. And so when you think about that, what's the, the object is to connect to another person for the creation of more life. And there is something that whether you're religious or not, if you view it that way, there's a sacredness to that. When you commodify that and you make it transactional and you make it about the self, and self-fulfillment it becomes i mean it becomes something that has been divorced from its actual point point. and jenny i think your audio is back on oh, okay good um yeah uh, it yeah. keeps cutting in and out though sorry that's okay what are your do you have you had a thought you wanted to respond to something jen was saying oh yeah i'm sorry i, I didn't quite get what you were saying Leslie. but i i mean i think that porn is the extreme of the um spectrum because what you said leslie earlier about seeing a picture of a movie star when you were a kid mm -hmm. and being mesmerized by it i know exactly what you mean and i would have that feeling even in well into my 30s mm -hmm. um and it, so i think the the porn i i personally think it's visuals in general not to sound like a member of the taliban but like um i think it's visuals in general that can produce extremely powerful reactions and set off chains of like emotions in us that we don't fully comprehend. And society and culture is in no way uh, making any kind of allowance for that or having, or sort of providing any sort of sane, common sense, humane structure for young people to process those chain reaction emotions that come when you see something very beautiful and then you want it but you also hate it and then, and then you're sad, but then you're also like, I'm going to, you know, like all of these complex things happen in your heart and mind. And so you take porn as Jen was saying, and then that's just like dialed up to a thousand because not only is it images, it's images of extremely, of extreme behaviors and you know, this, that all of that kind of um, hormone release and the addictive side of that. So it's a real clusterfuck if you don't mind my swearing um of 
simply too of, of an image saturated society. I don't know how to fix that, by the way. Like, I don't know. Like, I'm not saying we should go back to the Stone Age and and only have like cave uh, cave etchings. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know. Maybe it's a, more a matter of like helping young people understand and helping young people disconnect from images and giving them other things to do with their time that are more productive. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, you know, to go, go maybe send to circle back uh, to what you had talked about in the beginning, Leslie, like teaching young people and modeling productive behaviors for young people that allow some free, that allow a lot of, they allow freedom and pleasure and all, and, and the, and the, and the followings of youth, because you don't want to miss out on those opportunities necessarily. But just circling back to your uh, this body count idea, you know that that keep those in check because you know you were being of the same generation, you probably have this, had had similar experience to me. Like when I was in my teens and twenties, and you know every all the, my female friends were like, like we we had boyfriends, you know we weren't like mega sluts, but we weren't um, you know we weren't saving ourselves for marriage, but there was a check in wider society to extreme promiscuity. And so none of us, I mean, I don't think any of us were driven to go there anyway, because I think pe- women are driven to extreme promiscuity are, are probably acting out trauma. I'm not a therapist, but that's my, that's my observation from personal experience. So none of us were living that. But even if we had wanted to be extremely promiscuous, there was a sense of, a, of, of shame in the wider society of a woman who does that extreme behavior, mm-hmm. right? And now that's gone. So these well, two MMA fighters that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's a perfect segue to like maybe introduce yeah. that topic. And so the the idea that this there's this whole thing that has been um, going around or was maybe like a week or two ago going around on Twitter. And it was these MMA fighters. They're Dylan Dennis and Logan Paul. I don't follow MMA. I have no idea who these people are. This was sent to me and I read about it with interest because one of them, let's see, it was Logan was talking about Dylan's girlfriend. So Dylan got engaged to this beautiful woman, Nina Agdahl, who is, uh, I think she's Dutch or or Finnish or something. She's this beautiful girl, young woman. And the other guy started posting on his social media pictures of her with, with all these other guys that she had dated or kissed or clips of her um talking about sex and talking and she uh, and it was I, at first I was like oh my god this poor girl is being completely slut shamed but then you start to listen to some of the clips and she's really kind of enjoying this persona at least at some point in the past she was really playing up the I can't get enough I just want I just want to get laid and it was kind of this this it sounded like from what I've seen that she actually leaned into that persona pretty hard and was was you know playing around with her sexuality in a very open way but the point was that this was being done in order to discredit and unman the other the her boyfriend her her fiance so it was like look your girl has been with so many other people that was a way of of smearing him and taking him down a notch so this the that brought up a lot of thoughts for me what what you know and one of them was just in in a way if we're if we're complaining about the commodification and the lack of uh meaning in sexual discourse and in, in sexual ethics in our in our society having someone come out even if done in a bullying way as pro chastity and pro um so selectiveness i guess and and maybe not uh maybe anti-slutty in a way, there's something to that. There's something interesting about that because maybe we need a pressure that pushes people towards being a little bit more sexually conservative. If what we're, if we are complaining about the, the level of sex positivity that embraces kink and embraces multiple partners and ethical non-monogamy and all these other and porn and poly and whatnot. So there would be some sort of a counter social pressure that would embrace or push us towards chaste behavior however doing it this way puts all of the pressure on the woman to be the one to zip it up and say okay i'm the one who's gonna when women are really in by acting out the the slut if we will that is acting as a pleaser to 
to give to men's sexual nature. It's it's the woman coming out of her natural sexual nature in order to be more appealing to men. So what I want to what what I kind of thought of, and I'm I'm not articulating this very well, but it's like if if you're going to push women towards chastity, men need to be pushed towards it at the same time. And so you if a man is going to criticize a woman for being slutty and sleeping around, well, he better be the kind of man who's never looked at pornography and doesn't objectify women and doesn't encourage in women this the behavior that he's then criticizing them for. And so I don't know. I just I had a lot of thoughts around that. And I wonder what what you guys think. That's just kind of the background on that topic if people haven't heard about the body count thing body count as in how many partners you've had jenny i'm not sure if your volume's working again darn uh well, i have something to say about yeah. it yeah oh please well jenny well jenny hopefully fixes the yeah. <laughs> crazy audio stuff um you know i knew somebody in high school a guy who was you know extraordinarily promiscuous and also um basically was, um, you know, today would make, meet the legal criteria as um, a rapist, a person who would, um, you know, have sex with an unconscious or near unconscious or severely inebriated person at a party. And this guy, um, you know, made it clear that he wanted and expected to marry a virgin. Oh. So I think that, you know, I'm really... I'm really cautious about conversations, you know, where women's sexuality is criticized and where there's shaming tactics. And I don't believe in unrestrained sexuality at all. I am a big, big fan of boundaries and I think sexual and otherwise. And I think that women are not as uh, sociosexual as men, that we're more cut out for bonding. So I don't think, for most women, I don't think it is in their best interest to be promiscuous. And at the same time, I think that women are given such, such intensely mixed and confusing messages about sexuality and the use of our sexuality that really nobody knows how to handle their own sexuality. And so I find it really hard to criticize and judge when there's so much confusion. I mean, from the age of 12, boys and men became obsessed with my physical appearance, absolutely obsessed, either denigrating it because they didn't like it or chasing after it wildly and sometimes being lewd because they did. And, you know, I think it's, I think it's a lot for somebody to navigate and there's just kind of like this situation where you can't win either way, even in how you dress, you know, if you're kind of covering your body, well, maybe you have low self-esteem yeah. or you're a frump. And if you dress a little bit more scantily, well, then you're desperate or you're a whore or you're, you're overly seductive. I think it's really, really difficult for women to get a solid grasp on how to handle ourselves, how to present ourselves, especially when we're really young. Yeah. Am I back? Yes, you're, you're back. back. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a good reminder, Jen, of those horrible years when, um, everything when you're when you're a young girl young woman girl and you really are a target for so much horrifying attention it's so mortifying and uncomfortable and terrible um and yeah the, the mixed messaging is 100 percent true i mean it's gotten so much worse it was bad in the 80s but like it's so so much worse for young women um and what you know like leave like leaving aside the idea that this guy might have just been like this is smack talk you know like trying to get in someone's head before a fight whatever um but no he's he's totally full of shit um and even if it's true that she's a big hoe which maybe she is she probably is i don't, I don't know i don't care i don't know who she is um but my feeling on it is no no it's not men's business it's women's business and i do feel like women need to check um I, I, I was about to say check other women, but that's a little that's a little tricky, isn't it? When you're like then checking someone else's behavior and calling out and call out culture. But I do think that we need to, as women, stop validating and applauding from extreme promiscuity. I think it's 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 terrible. You're right; it doesn't benefit women at all. And I think um, girls 
like the the elders <laughs> which would include us, you know, the elders have lost, all, have not given these girls a moral compass. And the education system seems to have um, taught, like at least two generations of, of people that sexu sexuality is purely a, pl a pleasure, uh, a pleasure activity and has no significance whatsoever other than do you get off? And it's like a mechanical thing. And that's turned out to be catastrophic. Mm -hmm. I personally yes. feel in terms mm -hmm. of people's mental health. Yeah, I agree. And in terms completely. of people's souls, they're your soul and your morality. We have no morality anymore. There's no morality other than what does it make you feel good? And you know, jacking off a hundred times a day probably does feel kind of good, I guess. But like, what kind of life is that to lead? Whether you're a man or a woman. Now, the problem with men, you know, demanding the body count, as you said, Leslie, you're completely right. Like, I would always want to be like, well, who are you sleeping with? I mean, are you faithful to one woman and have you had, have you had two partners in your entire life or are you a man whore? Because right. if you are, then you're just 100% a hypocrite because what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And I'm sorry, my, like I've become more conservative as I've gotten older, but not on that, not on so that. Like, I want to ask you more. I'm not going to hide behind a wall where men are out whoring. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 I think that's a really, I think that's a really critical point. And I want to ask more about what you said when you said this isn't men's business, this is women's business, because I guess as I see it, it's a, it's both because it's women, heterosexual women anyway, if we're talking heteronormativity normativity or whatever. Um, <laughs> but that's, you know, I mean, that's, that's what we're talking about. So, um, but women, heterosexual women and heterosexual men, women want to be attractive to men, but they also want to be attractive competitively with other women there's a there's a competitive angle it's that same same thing i think that leads you to have that acquisitive jealousy when you mm -hmm. see someone like we were talking about at the opening of this conversation that same sort of longing to be is is it's sort of the beauty hierarchy it's the the yes. i want to be attractive i want to be the prettiest or or really pretty for reasons that are related to attracting men but also to achieving some kind of personal um yeah acceptability or or status or whatever that might be so there's that there's there's kind of that bifurcation of the, the attractiveness um i guess uh uh tendency or, or desire but to the extent that m what is attractive to men will drive female expression of sexuality anyway maybe not attractiveness but maybe attractiveness as well but definitely sexual behavior if a man if men start finding restraint sexier then women will i think on the whole lean into restraint more and if men are chasing the hot slutty promiscuous thing then that's going to be i what do you think i mean am i i'm oversimplifying but i wanted to go into that because you're saying it's it's uh this is not men's business this is women's business but i think that the motivator for a lot of sexual behavior is the opposite sex so i what don't do you know think? no i mean in a way i i know exactly what you mean and i i don't disagree with it but i i think something that is uh that would be antithetical to that and that is I think men go where women lead them. Okay. I think women are the kind of moral leaders in the home and set the tone and set the, set the boundaries for what's acceptable. So having said that, I do think, I don't know if you took, if you left, if you got like a bunch of like Amish women or like women who are very sort of cloistered from our current contemporary society and the porn and everything and threw in like a man whore in the mix who really liked like, you know, <laughs> Doggies, like, I don't know, I was like doggy style, like I'm an old lady <laughs> who like kinky stuff. Um, and you threw him in the mix with all the Amish girls suddenly become like big time hoes. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I just, when you said that, I was picturing like all these sweet looking Amish women, you know, butter churning and like some guy from Chippendales all of a sudden shows up just doing pelvic thrusts. <laughs> But I don't know. So I don't know if like if if kink and all these extreme like advanced sexual behaviors, as I like to call them, 
are inherent in women necessarily, but I well, think women can be, I think women can be naturally themselves very freaky and very into like, into weird stuff and like, and just like, yeah. I think they can just be hoes for the sake of being hoes. And I don't, I just don't, I don't necessarily buy that it's men driving it. But when I think about what it, what would be driving that behavior in women, actually, I don't have a better answer. So, well, here's I this. I have an you, answer. I don't have a comeback. <laughs> okay. I have a thought and I'd like, like to, to just pl- to try out based on what you're saying there. And it's something that's occurring to me. So, um, when you, you talk about, yeah, women have these, these, uh, tendencies as well. They can be really uh, pleasure seeking and promiscuous for its own sake. And that's true. I mean, we do see that it's not just a man. There's not like this fine black and white, you know, men are over here and women are over here, but there are more, we know there's general tendencies. So given the, there's the, the dual track mating strategy for men, right? The short term and the long term mating strategy, you know, short term is just, just try to score as many partners as you can have sex easily and quickly without commitment. Long-term is find somebody that you really think that you have a, a, a life you can live a life with and raise kids with. So there's those two. And maybe women have similar sorts of mating strategies. And one of them might be um, to uh, I hear my, my, um, my thinking is unraveling, but like if, if it's attractiveness, if it's a competition, then there will be some people who kind of cheat the system, right? So they know mm-hmm. that by exploiting the most um, the most uh, racy sexual parts of themselves, they can gain a lot of attention. And this sort of pushes the entire field towards that. So it's like if you have some girls who are willing to go all in, then that puts pressure on everybody else to play in that yeah. way if they want to get any attention. Yeah. So it it's it is so in that way. I would say that it's female led because it's the female it's the, these women who have for whatever reason, whether it be trauma, whether it just be their, their own need to be cared for, for whatever, you know, or to connect or whether it be attention seeking uh, high sociosexuality or, yeah. or sociopathy, maybe rebellious they streak, not, maybe yeah. they have low empathy and have no desire for that true connection. And they're just pleasure seeking. So for whatever reason, if they, are driving this thing by offering, yes, I will be on OnlyFans. Yes, I will be a stripper. Yeah. I will be, yeah. Well, yeah. I will opt into this lifestyle and I will push the field this way by advertising myself yeah. as extremely sexual, which is like candy for the man's sexuality, which wants to go there. Does that then drive the entire field? Yes. Uh, the entire culture yeah. towards that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've written about this before. I, ca- I call it the sexual arms race. It's like, mm. it's an escalation um and and I, but i never thought of it interpersonally i thought of it more as like how culture represents sex because remember in the eight, seven, remember in the 70s and the, in the 80s when movies were like tongue kissing and actual sex you know you could see actual sex and boobs and stuff and then it got you know now we've gotten to the point where like you can't watch a show because there's always someone performing kind of like this on somebody else <laughs> all the time it's just like whoa okay um and i like that's what i was referring to when it comes to sexual arms race because like you can't no one can de-escalate mm. and that's probably why i guess i mean i've i'm not in the dating market and i haven't been for so long that i i can only go by what i see on social media and not my own personal experience but do you know people who've had that experience Which louise experience? perry talks about it okay. in that book the case mm, against yeah. the sexual revolution how it used to be that the default assumption was the woman was not going to have sex with you until you were married. Now it's the default assumption that she absolutely is, and she's going to do it probably quite quickly. And so and she's going to do anal. <laughs> yeah, that you got that right. And <laughs> so if she was saying that if you are a woman now in the current dating market, it is virtually, it would basically be almost impossible for you to find a partner if you were not willing to have sex very, very soon in the dating relationship because everybody else does. So by not doing it, you don't even get a chance. You don't get your foot in the door to build a relationship that could potentially lead to marriage. Like with the exception of extremely religious communities where everybody is kind of on the same page and agreeing that sex is postponed until after marriage. And so I think it's really difficult for somebody who maybe is 
you know, non-religious or not from an extremely orthodox religion and who just wants to get to know somebody before they become sexually intimate. I think it's gotten progressively harder and harder for a person to do that. And it is being pushed by everybody who is wanting to or willing to go to bed on the first or second date. Yeah. And yeah. And I mean, I think like, and I think about it like the Andrew Tate kind of stance, which is, you know, there's hoes. It's a, it's a virgin whore thing. And that's, first of all, the virgin whore thing has been around since forever. That's always Uh been um, a, a trope that's used against women who are just normally sexually expressing themselves. Um, And I'm not, I'm not okay with that, but uh, it's it's a tie it's it's tired it's also it doesn't represent what true what women really are like women you know healthy women normal normal women um women whose brains haven't been completely addled by this over overly promiscuous society but who still you know want to enjoy sex and are maybe don't and don't have a husband or looking for a long term partner those women have you know they're not wrong to seek out partners the odd time like at all but are they going to be, so are these, are women who are kind of sensible and slightly based, are these, but not, you not, not fully religious and in a fully religious community, are these women then stuck trying to appease these sexual tyrants of, and hypocrites of men who are like, well, I can have as many whores as I want, but I want my wife to be a pristine virgin because that would be a very ugly scenario. Like I can imagine the person I was at 22 living in that reality would be extremely demoralizing and, and actually almost scary because the thing is, my personal opinion is, like, real men uh, don't find a woman's body count to be that threatening. I mean, I, personally, if, 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 if I think my, like, say, say like my husband, like, I think if, if he ha- had met me and I had an OnlyFans, he probably wouldn't have gone there. I think OnlyFans is beyond the pale. But, you know, he knew I'd been married before. He knew I had, I had partners before. Like, if, if your man finds that threatening, then that's an insecurity Again, unless you're like a crazy hoe, like that's an insecurity that that person I think feel needs to work on. That's them, not you. Like that's so what, what you're saying is that there's there's some moderation, and you're yes. talking about the extremes. And so the extremes being like demanding an absolute yes. virgin or or maybe like a single, you know, like one partner kind of thing, like very yes. very pre and the, or the only fans kind of i have been actually selling my sexuality yeah. in this way yes so you're that's the distinction you would make so well th- i think that's not that's not the distinction i make i mean i think that the that the, the, the vast majority of women are in between those two camps mm-hmm. and we're just and where would you draw the life. line when you say that it, it doesn't i seem personally draw the line at only fans and, and sex work I mean, not, I would draw the line if, if I was looking for that in a partner. What if, I wouldn't what if the girl that. was uh, like a bikini barista kind of thing or a stripper? <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> oh, do you not know what that is? Oh, it's this know. terrible thing. I think it's just really cheesy. They're, um, at, at least in Washington state, they have strippers in, in coffee shops. So it's drive up. serious? Have y'all not heard of this? Is this not a thing everywhere? I'm sorry. Else? Can I just interrupt? Yeah. If you're making a, if you're a barista in a bikini, you are going to get some serious steam burns on your like, uh, like this they're, sounds they're not just bikinis. They're like pasties. I mean, they're like, they, they're wearing a thong and like nipple covers and they're in these little boxes, these little drive up coffee shops that what? Yeah. They're all, yeah. It's a popular thing in Washington. You can't go anywhere without driving past a couple of these things. Okay, yeah, I yeah. would never heard of this before. That's insane. I know, I know. And it, that's it, insane. That's, and that's how accessible it is. That's how accessible. How is it any different to like the Amster, the women, the prostitutes in Amsterdam being in the windows? That sounds worse, actually. Well, I don't think that they're having intercourse with anybody or doing anything. I mean, I don't, I I don't feel know. Like being what a prostitute doing. is a far more honest way of going about it than that. I don't know. Sorry, that's. I, I, this is the first I'm hearing of this, so I don't know, but. Um, yeah, I, w- I personally would draw the line at any kind of professional exhibitionist sex work. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I think that's... So at the point where money is changing hands and you're doing it as a a, yeah. a consumable transaction. I mean, I'm, I'm not transactional. a man, obviously, but yeah, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be. Mm-hmm. I, I, would, I would avoid that. And I would you also draw the line at 
a male partner who has engaged yes. in that? Okay. So 100%. that's where the line yeah, is yeah. for you. It's once, yes. the, once it's become yes. commodified and transactional in that and public way. and public. I public. see. I'm like a big believer in privacy. I, I really feel like, you know, I mean, I don't, you know, what you do in private is mostly your business, obviously like magnified by the entire, like a population level that's, it becomes trickier, but like fundamentally what you do in private is your business. I don't, I don't care. And I, I have a lot of, um, I, I'm not particularly moralistic about people's private, private behavior, but I'm, I have very strong boundaries between public and private. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if a woman has gotten to the age of 30 and has had 60 to a hundred partners, I don't know. I feel like that's her business. I don't think that's any man's business. I mean, also you, I personally would say like, well, take, take the person as a whole, like don't fixate on a weird stat. Like this is like a freaking car or a baseball player. Like, does she have a good job? Does she have good relationships with her family? Does she have good friends? Does she have good relationships or like non hostile relationships with her ex? Does she fall out of everybody? Like those to me would be more important indicators of the of of the health of, of this person, like the mental health, the, the mental well being of this person, than how many dudes she's banged. Like, so just to play devil's advocate on this, because I think that it's it. This is this con. This whole idea, this body count conversation, really did bring up a lot of mixed feelings in me. Like I feel yeah. like there's there's a lot of complexity to it. Does the signaling by men that there's something undesirable about being promiscuous does it give the woman who doesn't want to be promiscuous more permission and more pride in her own ability to to, to stay say no does it does it sort of counter Probably. that pressure that like you said the uh arms race pressure does it give them something to rest back on and say hey i i don't i'm going to be comfortable saying uh i don't want to engage in that I would say yes, but with a caveat that not if it's um, accompanied by this very loaded. Uh oh, Jenny froze. <laughs> Jen, what do you no, think? No, not again. Not again. Um. Okay. First, oh, are you back now? I don't think we have sound yet. Now, yeah, still so no sound. Yeah. All right. When you get that figured so, out. So, no, I think first off, you know some of the men that are making these comments where they're, um, you know, sort of, you know, slut shaming to use that term, mm -hmm. um, women for their body counts, I think are, I think some of that is rooted in misogyny. So I don't look to those type of men to give me permission mm -hmm. to, uh, boink or not to boink or do anything whatsoever, <laughs> because mm -hmm. I just, and I just discount them entirely and I don't want them anywhere near me. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also wanted to say in terms of the, um, the whole coffee shop, you know, kind of semi stripper thing, I just think, wow, how nice for men that everything <laughs> revolves around their genitalia and no wonder, no wonder they have such an attitude of entitlement towards women and objectification. And I think that, you know, women are also responsible and I understand for women, it's really confusing because of what I talked about earlier, all the mixed messages, but it does sometimes piss me off when women take jobs like that because it's putting out there again, this is the most important thing about me, how I can serve you sexually, how I can serve you visually. And then that gets into, it does affect how men perceive women. If everywhere we went, right. There were guys in little booty shorts exploiting themselves, acting all like coy and sexualized for our pleasure. I think we would start to look at guys in a kind of objectifying, dehumanizing way. Right. And I don't really appreciate women doing this because when they do it, they're not just doing it to themselves. They're doing it to all of us. Like, how are we supposed to be taken seriously, walking around, serving coffee, with little pasties right. on our tits and acting all, eh. oh. you know, thank you very fucking much for doing that. Am I back? And a guy, yeah. a guy yeah, goes, back. imagine a guy going to a coffee shop and getting his, getting his fucking coffee at a hard on in the morning before he heads into the office. But then he has to make the transition in his head that the women in his office are equals and to be treated with respect and that their right. colleagues and not there in some way 
as like jerk off material, I think it might be a little difficult to make that transition. Right. And the women in the office are going to pay for it is what I think. Right. That's, might- that's just me. Cause I've seen, I've seen, like I've worked with, around a bunch of horny, immature men before, um, in very highly professional settings where people that worked there were highly educated. And if one woman would kind of play into how that guy was acting by being flirtatious and coy and sexual with him, he would start doing it more with the surrounding women because he thought he'd found himself a receptive field. And it harms, it harms all of the women in that circumstance. Yeah, I actually, I agree with you. And I think, Jen, that you're a little too hard on men, actually, in this regard, because I feel like, you know, we really have to drill home the message that you will, people will treat you as you let them treat you. Mm -hmm. And especially women, we literally are the centers of the universe. Where, where did we go so wrong that we feel like we need to, like, display our precious, like, scarce resource of our bodies and our spirits and our minds and everything in a coffee shop like that's the most insane thing i've ever heard like i said before being a prostitute in a window in amsterdam is so much more honest and so much more healthy i would go so far as to say well because you're absolutely right power that comes with that i mean i think that the young woman who's feeling beautiful and getting a lot of feedback that she is desirable there's something very very compelling about that and i think yes it's compelling because it well, it encourages mm-hmm. you to be an exhibitionist, mm-hmm. and and a, and a, I mean, a, it's kind of narcissistic, isn't it? It, oh, it doesn't seem like a healthy yeah. validation at all. Mm-mm. It seems like no. the opposite of a healthy validation. You're an exhibitionist. You're indulging in your own fetish, and you're getting validation from other people who, as Jen Riley said, are now going to go go off and like everyone. It's it's all jerk off material. Well, like, but it's is, is the owner who's who carries the onus here? Who the is the woman? the young woman who's 18 but don't do it but by what standard how does society tell that woman that that's not okay when everything else is is saying come that's right yes and she's and she's and she's rewarded for it you know in graduate school i knew a really nice girl she was working at a hooters and why was she working there instead of a different restaurant to put herself through graduate school because it bloody well paid more and you get bigger tips you do get rewarded in the short term for that type of behavior. And so there's enticement for women. And the hook is also, you know, women all worry about, are we pretty enough? Am I good enough? And if you get into an environment like that, where you're constantly getting that validation, that's the hook that, that pulls you in. That is the hook is right. getting that male approval and validation. And so women have to learn to value themselves without yeah. needing this constant reassurance. Yes, you're pretty. Yes, you're sexy. And that is yeah. difficult for that's difficult for women because we keep getting told that it's it's so important. It's everything. And so then you'll do anything to get reassurance that you you are that that you have that. Mm-hmm. I I have a theory. I have like a, my own personal theory. <laughs> this is just completely unscientific, but I personally think that each one of us has is born with a moral compass and we share that moral mm. compass across cultures and uh, very it's very broad but like it's very fundamental and not being overly sexually promiscuous is one of those fundamental tenets of our i would say biological moral compass i know this is gonna sound wacky to people who are like real scientists or whatever but fine um and i think you're right to say, you know, what, what do these girls do when societal messaging is all going in the other direction? But I think if women learn to know deep down inside, like men know deep down inside that they can't be women and, you know, and kids know deep down inside that they shouldn't be bratty and they shouldn't misbehave. We all deep down inside recognize good behavior from bad behavior. We all do it. And m- many, many, many people, millions of people at this point have been programmed out of that. And that's a tragedy. And it cataclysmic problem for society but i still think it's there there's a little green shoot there still Mm -hmm. and i think if girls are given i don't i mean yeah we can't put it on society you have to find your inner reserve to listen to that inner voice that inner strength and be like you know what actually i think this is kind of gross why Mm -hmm. am i standing making a cappuccino in in pasty like what like this is this is not only gross it's ridiculous it's ridiculous you look stupid it's mm-hmm. ridiculous. It's embarrassing. Mm-hmm. Don't do it. 
Like, I think people recognize that deep down inside. And in, what is in that in thing? What, how do we states, call to that? How does it, I do think that you're right about it being an individual choice. But well, also, I'll tell you what, when you talk the about the deprogramming and the grooming people into this yeah, sex positive the, culture that we've got. And the, and the Andrew Tates of the world aren't, aren't it. They're, they are not it. Um, and I don't like, I don't have hate for Andrew Tate or anything. I just don't, I think his, his messaging on this is, is bullshit. Um, but yeah, like, I don't think Andrew Tate understands women. I think he understands men, but not women. Anyway, I don't want to digress, but, um, yeah, I don't, I don't really, I don't know. I mean, I, again, I don't think maybe, maybe just saying it out loud. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm yeah jenny froze up again um we got we're gonna have to get a better jenny feed for next time <laughs> oh man no jenny i i really liked your idea about everybody being born with some sense of inherent um morality and i'd love to see that more developed i hope you'll write about that sometime in a sub stack it's really okay. interesting i think there's some i do think thank there's you. some truth to it you know that and it yeah, reminds me you. jenny of uh, in my own my own life I when I was in my early 20s I worked in a bar uh, in San Antonio that's where I'm from and I worked in this bar it was um, pretty bustling a lot of uh, councilmen and businessmen would come in it was downtown and I there was this one guy who would come in who was the owner of a strip club it was this big strip club gentleman's club as they call them Giorgio's in San Antonio and he would try to get me to work for him he, you know, I was just a like 21 year old um, waitress, you know, and he would say, come work for me. And I didn't want to be a stripper. He said, you don't have to be a stripper. You can just, we do the waitresses are topless, but they never take off their bottoms or whatever it is, you know? And I'm just like, that's it to me. It was like, no way I would never, I, there was, right. you're talking about this internal compass, this internal moral system. Right. I, for me, it was a hard no, like right. absolutely not. And yet it was so flattering to me that he wanted yeah. me to do that. It was so flattering to me that I would get th that I would get somebody telling me that I was beautiful in that way. It was there was something like I don't I had the the hard stop. No. I was already a mother by right. that time. I had right. Uh, I had one child. Maybe no, I think it was before I had my second daughter, but um also I thought my why would I tell my mother you know, my, my, what would my family think if I did something? There right. were just like all kinds of reasons why it was, it was a non-starter, but at this, even though it was a non-starter that, that it, it was like the highest compliment, it, it played to my vanity and it right. was, there's a really heady sense of that. I mean, I, I can see if I had had different modeling, different values modeled for me, yeah. if my mother had been a different kind of way uh, you know my family had represented different values how i would have jumped at that chance to be thought yeah to be told that i was beautiful in that way yeah yeah and i also i want to be clear like i have a huge amount of empathy and sympathy for women who are strippers and do only fans and are prostitutes and who have these exhibitionist tendencies um but i do i mean i i, I feel for them and i don't think they're bad people at all quite the contrary i think a lot of them I think I think the terrible stereotype cliche of like the the, the hooker with the heart of gold is probably very accurate, um, but I think they're damaging themselves. And um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't say, oh well, you used to be a hooker. I'm not going to hire you for any job, or you know, I'm not going to be your friend or anything like that. But in terms of an intimate relationship. Um, I would have, I would give, it would give me pause, but I don't mean to say that they should be banished from society at all. So I just want to make that clear. Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess that brings up another thing that it, do people have the, do people have the power to change and to be different yes, than, you 100%. know, and, and do we forgive Absolutely. and how do we move forward? So. Yes. They want to uh, do, but what do you do with only fans? It's right. there forever. It's there. Yeah. What do you do? With I Instagram? know. Like, right. You're putting that yeah. on the internet. That's the problem. That's right. Absolutely, people have it. Most people do. Do you guys remember Apollonia from the Prince and the Revolution uh, band? She was a wild slut, like that. Like, not even an insult. Like, she was in this. She did the song "Sex Shooter." I'm a sex shooter, shooting love in your direction. She was absolutely stunningly hot, like sexy woman. 
and all her videos she's like in the Chinese lingerie and anyway it's like she became a born again Christian and she became like and so did so did Diana Summer by the way women who have these extreme like 70s and 80s experiences in these extreme party lifestyles a lot of them really they they literally repent it's hard you can't live that life forever it's but is that and so is that part of the the is that part of the timeline arc for yes for a number of women then is that just is it just a natural thing that you will yes capitalize on your youth and beauty and then repent later yes yeah and that that's literally what women used to do i just i was reading a book about the borgias and in the renaissance women who after they'd been through a few marriages these are noble women and they had produced heirs and you know been and shunted about and chosen their own husbands and then had lovers and had promiscuous they women were always promiscuous by the way that's what really irks me about the incel bro thing and the Andrew Tate thing like this is new women have always been promiscuous this is not new like this is not new we're we're the same creatures that we've always been as are men well kind of maybe not men but women are kind of the same creatures but what used to happen was they would hit middle age and they would go to the convent and they would say i've had enough with this nonsense either by choice or because they were forced to but a lot of it was by choice. Like, I've had enough with you nonsense men, you know, fucking around. I'm going to the convent. Literally. <laughs> literally with repent. So it's a, it, is a, it is a developmental arc of, 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 of females. You know, you're a little girl. You're a teen. You experiment with, like, some level of, of promiscuity. And then you're, you're supposed to mature. And then eventually you're supposed to, like, kind of let it go and let it be in your past. And we society can't accept that now. It's like that is really be, interesting. Like, so then it almost implies that forever. that attractiveness and sexuality is the domain of young women and men of all ages. If that's what I you're mean, saying, I mean that's an that, interesting that, that, thought. I'm not saying that's my opinion. That's no. always the way. That's always been the way it's it's been though. Like, no, that's, that's not a, my opinion. That's no, it's not my opinion either. But it's fascinating to think that I don't know. That might be something to explore. I yeah. Heard, Elliot going off like the one hour alarm because we yeah. just hit an hour. Of like it's time. <laughs> oh, uh, by the way, I just have to say at the beginning I was like distracted by how he was looking up at you, Jen. Like she just said, a smart. <laughs> he's, like, every word. he's in love with me. <laughs> oh my god, it's so cute. <laughs> well, who wouldn't be? Uh, no. Well, it's super nice to talk to you guys. And um, sorry about my messed up audio. Oh. Yeah, it happens. We'll I'll make a note in the in the video notes. But um, Thanks so much. yeah, any final thoughts, Jen? Mm, no, just uh, there's something about this topic that I find um, really exhausting. But it's so complicated, and there's so much. Ooh, it, there's a lot of weight to it. I feel like, and there's um, a lot of things that are like harmful and dark. And I, I think, yeah. I think sexuality should be light and it should be involved with love and creation. And I, I hate it when it's distorted. And I think that's why I object in a way uh, so strongly to things yeah. like only fans and stripper baristas. And, you know, it's like, just, just, yes, enjoy sex, but don't use it as some kind of like cheap, all you can eat buffet well yeah. said jenny what do you think any final thoughts um not to be totally crass but i'm very close to 2,000 subscribers on my sub stack so if if some of y'all want to like uh subscribe i would be very excited to get to pass that 2,000 mark <laughs> awesome and again that is saving culture from itself yes and it's my name jenny e holland uh dot sub stack dot com great i'll put a, a link in the um if you want to send, or maybe you did yeah. send me a couple of your pieces that you referred to sure. in this, we can put those links in the notes as well. So people I'll can go check right those now, out actually. and subscribe and give you their feedback in the comments. Great. Thanks. Yeah, everybody. Thank That's you so much fun as for, always for having this great chat and we'll schedule another one. That's great. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.